FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's 8 28 18. Well, the move is complete. The new studio's up. We're putting in some more equipment, so the video is going to be forthcoming. You know, when I do things, I have to have great production values. Can't do stuff half assed. It's just not my nature. Hey, as always, we invite you to join the dialogue. I'm about 100 emails behind right now, but I'll crank them out over the next couple of days. So the email address is kl at kerrylutz.com. Hey, if you're listening on YouTube, click that subscribe button and that ringer so you get notified whenever we post a new show. Well, talked a lot about the gold standard, about precious metals, why they're so important, why they're not barbarous relics. And when I was in Freedom Fest, had the pleasure of sitting at a table for the awards, for the uh, cinema awards dinner, which I never went to before, and met a well-known individual by the name of Nathan Lewis. And Nathan, you were formerly a chief economist, uh, and you provided advice to institutional investors. Now you run pri a private investing partnership in my former home state of New York. And we've seen your work all over the place. Financial Times, Asian Wall Street Journal, Huffington Post. I mean, I could go down the list, which I won't. But uh, you've written three books about the gold standard. So for all of you out there who, who are uh, really concerned about the concept of money, I figured Nathan would be a great person to have on the show. So welcome to the show. Hi, Gary. Great to be here. Uh, so gold. Uh, right now we're looking at gold. This is around $1,200. It was over $1,300 two months ago. It's taken a hit. It was almost at 2000 back in 2011. It's basically been a market, the equivalent of uh, watching paint dry, except the uh, the paint was the wrong color that you put on the wall and you really don't feel like going over it again. I mean, it's just not been much happening in the precious metals markets. Not good anyway. Um, yes. Well, one of the funniest things of the last five years or so is just in what a narrow range the, the dollar gold price has varied. And it led to a certain amount of scratching of heads recently that, uh, that maybe is, is the Fed on sort of a, a shadow of gold standard because it it works whether you if, if the dollar's value is stabilized versus gold it works whether it's a hard fix thirty five dollars an ounce or if it's, if it's loose right if it, if it varies between thirty three and thirty eight or eleven hundred and thirteen hundred it's not as good as being a hard fix of course but it accomplishes many of the same same objectives um, I think there were a lot of people sort of in the broader conservative area uh, you know Republican thought leaders and so forth, who recognize that the big move in gold from under 300 in, in 2001 to over momentarily over 1900 in 2011 uh, represented a decline in dollar value, a pretty shocking one, actually, uh, which was reflected in all kinds of statistics, dollars value versus zero commodities. You know, copper went from 80 cents to $4. All this stuff was going on. And I think, uh, you know, <laughs> someone panicked. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And and it, no one said anything really, but uh, it kind of looks like maybe that is is what's been going on over the last couple of years. And I would remind also that uh, Alan Greenspan was fairly outspoken, or has become a fairly outspoken uh, gold standard advocate. And he said during the '90s very explicitly that yeah, he was you know targeting gold, trying to keep the dollar value versus gold in a fairly tight band. And um, also during the Volcker era, Volcker was less of a gold fan than, than Greenspan, but after the so-called monetarist experiment blew up in, in, in 1982 and Volcker realized that you just, monetarism was something not something that anyone could practically do, they went to um, sort of a commodities gold. It's fairly loose. If you look at the history of that time, you know, commodities prices are all up and down all over the place, but they didn't, but they, but they were within an within established range. They didn't just go trending in one direction or the other. So. Mm -hmm. The point being, uh, this long explanation is the idea that 
if we can't have a formal gold standard, then we can have a, an informal one, uh, you know, a crude one to save, at least save our bacon, right? Um, yeah. It's been around a long time. It was there in the 80s, it was there in the 90s. Uh, when Bernanke was coming in in the 2000s, we sort of forgot about it, and, and the dollar took a big pratfall, basically. And I think, I think uh, it, I sense that we're going back. To, we went back to the wisdom of the, of the 80s, 90s to some degree. It's hard for me to say to what degree, but the extraordinary, extraordinary stability of the dollar versus gold over the last few years, um, I don't think can happen strictly out of random chance. Mm-hmm. So it's actually, so is it mani- manipulating the price of gold or controlling the, the dollar to be in tune with the price of gold? Well, ideally, what you have is a free market in gold, um, you know, in, in large bullion for immediate delivery and, and large size, you know, billion dollar size. Um, and then you manage the value of the dollar so that it maintains an equivalent value of gold. It's just like a currency board, right? If, mm-hmm. if you know, the Hong Kong dollar is linked to the U.S. dollar, Hong, Kong, you know, Hong Kong's not manipulating the value of the U.S. dollar, right? <laughs> That's not going on. What right. they're doing is they're managing the value of the Hong Kong dollar so that it maintains its parity with the U.S. dollar. Well, that's how the gold standard is supposed to work. You're supposed to main, manage the value of the U.S. dollar so that it maintains its parity with gold. You're not, you're not trying to you know, manipulate gold. Mm-hmm. But ideally, that's what you're supposed to do, and that's the way it was done in the 19th century, more or less. Um, the way things are today when there's issues with all the paper gold markets in the comics and the LBMA and all these rumors flying around about funny things going on, and it's hard to say what's really going on here. Um, but overall, uh, but I, I do think so. Something, you know, whatever's coming out of it, they're, they're kind of every, everything's being manipulated these days, right? Mm-hmm. To some degree, it seems to me. Sure. It seems to me, and, and many people share that view. Absolutely. And and it's hard to say exactly what's going on here, but but it sort of works anyway, right? It, I, as long as e- even if it's manipulated, even if it's a paper price rather than a than a, than a real price, so to speak, even if it's nothing, you know, unsustainable. Nevertheless, in, in the broad picture over the last several years, we haven't had any real, you know, real obvious monetary problems. We haven't had you know, yeah. anything that is no. obviously blowing up. Not in so, the U.S. So, Not in the U.S. But, so, so, yeah. So, so in a sense, even though it might be extremely artificially produced, uh, in the very broadest terms, we, we do seem to have achieved our goals of you know, the ultimate goal of gold standard, which is you know, some, some form of monetary stability. Um, whether it's sustainable, when I, when a lot of these things started to happen in 2013, everyone's like, you know, what's up? The, the physical market and the paper market have, you know, reached this weird schism. I wouldn't have guessed that it would be when they've been able to make, to be maintained for very long, but now here we are and, and who knows, right? <laughs> um, so yeah. a lot of questions there. I can't really, no definitive answers for me. Yeah. I understand that. So, uh, what about this uh, concept here of of what's of the uh, East accumulating gold and supposedly the West pretty much selling off their gold? Uh, what are the long term right. ramifications of that? Um, well, it's it's pretty clear. Uh, I, I think I think those those reports are are broadly accurate. Um, you know what the quantities are. Maybe no one is certain, um, but I think those reports are broadly accurate. That the, the basically the big Physical vaults of the West are being drained or have been drained, mm-hmm. and and it's pretty clear I think that China and Russia and others like minded like minded governments um, have always you know China also has a, has a has a tradition of, of gold and silver based mining going back thousands of years just like Europe does and of course Russia does too and being basically the eastern portion of Europe and their intellectual we, we, their intellectual traditions are different than ours, right? We, we, we consider discussion about monetary policy and gold and so forth. It's really just the English language discussion, right? And, and so we're talking about U.S., Britain, Canada, New Zealand, basically, right? Mm-hmm. What do the Germans think about gold? Well, we don't really know because they don't read German, right? What do the French people think about it? Well, what do the Chinese people think about it? Well, I, I can tell you one thing is I was at a Cato event just, and, it was, and I wasn't a speaker, I was just attending. And I was just, you know, sort of milling around in the, in the reception era area with a drink in my hand. And this Chinese guy comes up and talks to me. He's like, I know, I know who you are and blah, blah, blah. And 
And he turned out to be like this honcho from the bank, you know, the People's Bank of China, uh-huh. uh, a major, a major, like you know, a researcher, part of the part of the policy board, and so forth. Yeah. And he knew where I was by by sight, right? <laughs> Amazing. Uh, so so people in China are onto these things. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I participated in, in a documentary of monetary topics in China that was produced by the largest television station in China data on television. So, so they're over there, they're educating the people with state with state television. Um, over here we get propaganda. Yeah. So, no, the point being, the, the point being is that, uh, is that their views about this stuff is probably a lot like the views of listeners here, but there's, but more widely held. Um, and where it goes, I don't, you know, it's hard to say where it goes. It, it um, they probably don't know themselves, but they're they're making preparations for a number of contingencies. Mm-hmm. I, I think there there is a suspicion that the West, not the West financial system, will will more or less blow itself up at some point. And we've heard these stories for years, and the, and they haven't come true for the most part. Uh, but whether it's kind of like the derivative of insanity at the big banks, or the tendency of most developed Western governments to be uh, kind of you know in over their heads in terms of government debt and entitlement commitments and just sort of political weakness inability to deal with these with these issues mm-hmm. uh they look at this and and they say well you know when governments get themselves in those kind of situations usually the first thing that goes with it's not, not one of the first things but eventually what goes is the currency too right mm-hmm. and yeah, it was only it was only a, and we've already seen years of, of government printing money basically to fund deficits and fix the sovereign bond markets and, and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's already kind of happening. So I, th- I think, I think that, you know, it's, I wouldn't look at it as an aggressive thing. Like they're trying to kick out the West, but they're, they, it's more like self preservation, right? Like when those guys sure. go down, we better have an alternative um, plan kind B. of approach. Yeah. You got to have um, a plan B. But, so yeah, they need to have plan B because for example, as they're well aware, when the U S when Kerflui in 1971 and, and, you know, failed to manage the dollar, but correctly, it took down everybody. Right. Yeah. It wasn't. Yeah. So Chinese look at that. It's like, well, we don't want to be a part of that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's going to have something like that's going to happen again. We're, we want to have, uh, you know, some kind of alternative up and ready to go. Um, and so I, I think, I think that's all that, all that's going on. So there's insurance policy. Yeah, so I wouldn't look at it as an aggressive thing. And and if there is if there is a future China, Russia, India, et cetera, gold block, it doesn't mean disaster for the United States, right? It, necessarily. Um, mm-hmm. when the US the dollar su- supplanted Britain as the world's premier international currency, it, you know, you didn't have hyperinflation in Britain, right? The British pound did have many devaluations, which is why people said uh, you know, Sorry, we're not interested in British pounds anymore. Um, but it doesn't mean that the U.S. That's not like you're we're losing a world war or something like that, right? <laughs> these kind of these kind of metaphors of conflict. It just means that uh, it just means quarantine, basically, right? It's like, well, you just got to suffer to your own problems by yourself, right? Right. Kind of kind of thing, I think. Mm-hmm. I see what you're saying. So, uh, long term, we're going to see gold. Do you think go up because uh, the system does seem to have problems? I mean, we've got uh, what's going on now: uh, developing uh, countries' currencies imploding. It's like yes. it's a contagion, I think, and it could very well reach the developed world. It's kind of like the last time, the last disaster in oh eight oh nine. What happened? Right. It started in the U.S. and minor, relatively controllable, minor subprime mortgage market and then it became a contagion that engulfed the entire world are we going to see something like that again or is it manageable um certainly one thing i have to say about the current period is I, i've had many years of research into into economic history and, and some of these you know booms and crashes kind of stuff over history and, and bringing to that the, the perspective of, of someone who has worked on Wall Street, right, and has has managed money and so forth, which most economists haven't. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, based on that, based on all my his, historical readings and so forth, that it's very hard to find any historical analog to what, what we have today. <laughs> <laughs> right? 
Mm-hmm. I, it's, I can't, it just things, it's, it's things at the same time seem so crazy. And at the same, at the, at the other hand, seem so placid, right? Yeah. By all, all, all indications, the U.S. economy doing quite well. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are other things that look like they might blow up, but they kind of stubbornly refused to for a long time. So, but, but, uh, but to, to get back to some of your points, what's, what's going to happen or what might happen? Um, I think the, the 1998 series of crises and the 2008 series of crises do have some interesting uh, elements, which I think we might see again. And one of them was uh, not a dollar decline, but a dollar rise. Uh, in 1998, we saw the dollar go from, oh, what is it, what, 380 or so per ounce in, 19, in the beginning of 97 to, to 270 or 280 or so mm-hmm. in 1998. And, and, that, and that dollar rise was accompanied by emerging market blowups across the world. Right. Um, and, and which led to the uh, LTCM debacle, which is, you know, had financial ramifications, um, sovereign defaults in Russia, and right. many, you know, many things. Uh, and then the two, that, 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 so that, that was, that was U S sourced in the sense that it was the U S dollar that was rising, but it wasn't, you know, there weren't really a lot of financial problems in the U S leading into it. Now, now then in, in 2008, we did have, we did have these, you know, financial issues, all this, you know, all these loans that really shouldn't have been made and mm-hmm. derivative silliness. And, um, and that, and that was, that was the, the heart of the crisis. But then as the crisis developed, in about you know, in basically the second half of 2008, again we had had a big dollar rise. Uh, dollar went from a thousand dollars per ounce of gold all the way to 700 in the space of two months right. or whatever it was, three months, and also rode against current foreign currencies across the board. And again, you had so again this dollar rise. You had emerging market currencies blow up across the board, which introduced this new element of of well monetary chaos, right? Because all these currency pegs were breaking. And then financial chaos because all of these, let's say, German banks who made a loan to Slovakia or not in Slovakia but Ukraine, sure, uh, because they because the Ukraine government had a had an overt policy of maintaining a stable exchange rate and had successfully done so for a number of years. And then you know then the currency peg blows up, and then their German bank has huge losses, and then you know yeah. and you have a finance, that kind of financial problem too. Right. So so that was happening there. Um, and there was another, another another interesting example that I would make note of is Japan in the, in the late eighties when the yen went from two hundred sixty yen per dollar to about a hundred in the late eighties. Um, another currency rise scenario. So the point being is, is that we, we've seen that we're starting to see that again, and we're starting to see it very early. The dollar has risen, but it hasn't risen very much, right? True. <laughs> and and even despite that, everything's blowing up, right? All this emerging market stuff is kind of going up in flames, and I, and and there's a very much like this. I sense a I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't call it a herd mentality, but I've seen this before mentality among among big institutional investors, you know, hedge fund types, and but not just hedge fund people, but all, all kinds of people. Sure. Um, who've seen yep, when the dollar rises, like bail out of our emerging markets, right? Before everyone else does, kind of response going on. Um, and at the and at the same time, there's there's Domestic problems throughout Europe, uh, in terms of banks and in terms of sovereign debt and so forth. Um, so, if it, so one of the so one of the point being, points here is that in the environment of crisis, uh, people don't big institutional money doesn't go to gold. They can't own gold, right? Uh, and basically, almost at all. And they should, but they should be able to, but they can't. And they can't. And, they, and so, what they pile into is basically dollars. So. Uh, these crisis kind of situations, I think it was definitely true in 2008, can produce a big dollar rise. One of the funny things, if you look back in history, uh, the British pound, at the outbreak of World War One, the British pound, this so-called gold window closed on the British pound, right? So the British pound became a floating currency, divorced from gold. Its value actually went up. You know, it went up a good 10 or 15% or so from its previous gold parity because when there was war on the continent and everyone was scrambling to safety, they piled in the British pound. Right. Yeah, which is really logical. Oddly enough. It's very logical when you think about it that the capital is going to flee to its safest uh, perceived alternative within reason and convenience as a factor. Europe's a small continent when you get down to it with a lot of people in it. And British banks appear to be, you know, again, the best uh, best looking horse in the glue factory there. So, yeah. yeah. 
you know. Yes, and, and, and if you want to get a little more of a technical level, um, if you're going to own dollars, you're going to own basically one of two things. You're going to own liabilities of banks. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, big institutional money is not stupid enough to see that there's some danger there, right? Yeah. Or you're going to go, or you're going to own one way or the other uh, deposits at the Fed, right? Mm-hmm. Cash, cash at the Fed, base money, right. which is, you know, not, not going to default. So it naturally produces a, a increase in demand for for deposits at the Fed um, via some intermediary, right? Via some European bank which has a U.S. division, which is a member of the of the Federal Reserve system, and so forth. Right. At the same at the same time, we have we have sort of a a, a cap on on supply um, because the Federal Reserve more or less has a policy of not allowing the monetary base to increase anymore. And in fact, it's it's kind of you know running it off slowly, right? Mm-hmm. And so they have the, the potential uh, confluence of an uh, increase in demand with a, with a limited supply, and that's, which is exactly what happened in 2008. The, when everyone was scrambling for cash, it drove the dollar up. And, it, and the issue was resolved when, when the monetary base was expanded dramatically, you know, like, like by multiples, basically, and, and later in 2008. And then, the, and then the value of the dollar sank back to more or less where it began. So e- even from kind of a, a technical perspective, um, there's it suggests that we might be in a dollar rise period if things like some of the banking default jitters in, in Europe or, or the emerging markets crisis continues. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. but, uh, but at, but at some point something's going to happen, right? Um, yeah. for one thing, something whether people, people take gold seriously or not, people, it's going to be broadly understood that the dollar is in fact, you know, rising in value. If it rises a lot, right. If it goes up 20, 30%, I guess. Of course. The turn. They're going to say, you know what, this is not such a good thing, and they're going to, they're going to, someone's going to step up and going, someone's going to do something about it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that would probably be a, pretty, be a pretty nice time to own. That, that would probably be a pretty nice time to own some gold. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's, a, it's not necessarily. A, so the, part of the question is, you know, what's the magnitude of this going to be? Um, if we're going to go to nine hundred on 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 gold, if it all rises, well, that might be a tradable event from where we are now, right? Mm-hmm. Pretty big move. Um, if we're going to go to Eleven hundred from twelve hundred. Well, I don't know. Is I mean, are you really going to trade that? You know, eight percent move. So, yeah, so uh, it's hard. It's it's hard to yeah. say what, what what might happen there. I, mm-hmm. I, I I do think I do think that we appear to be in a broader uh, like you know multi year crisis era in which all these things where they're kind of you know trying to paper over and so forth are are not going to you know they're going to come to a resolution I think, and in that resolution. Uh, gold might be the last, last thing standing. Um, even if the, you know, even if the dollar doesn't become worthless or whatever, even if the dollar goes up in value, well, if you, if it, even if the dollar goes up in value, but you own $10 million in, in, you know, ABC bank, which goes bust <laughs> or something, <Yeah. laughs> well, where does that leave you? Right. Or you own, or you own, uh, even U S government bonds, right. You own 90 day treasury bills that get, they get, that get, get wow. <laughs> Well, they become they become thirty year zero coupon bonds, right? At, at a two percent interest rate, <laughs> or something, right? Mm-hmm. Which means their market value goes down by seventy percent or something like that. Um, where does that leave you, right? Good so even even if the so called price of gold doesn't go doesn't necessarily go to ten thousand or ten billion or whatever, um, it might be a nice environment to own gold. Yeah, um, and the, uh, and I think we'll have to kind of cut it off at that. Nathan, but it's fascinating, okay. fascinating to think. And I, I see you've really spent a lot of time considering the alternatives like so many of you out there. And, you know, the future is always uncertain. Uh, what, what did Yogi Berra say? Uh, prediction is very hard, especially about the future. And uh, that's kind of the situation we're in. Hey, if we want to find out more about you, uh, check out your writings. Where is the best place to go to to find you? Uh, my website is newworldeconomics.com. Um, it's most of my writings about economic topics. It's not really about investing per se. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I wrote a, took me over 20 years of, of research, wrote a three volume trilogy about gold standard issues, which I, which I hope will serve as a, as a resource for whatever comes out of this crisis period, because everyone's focused on, oh, this be this crisis and that crisis, the other crisis. Yeah. But I focused on, well, what happens afterwards? Yeah, that's the important that's, thing. You got, you got, you got to yeah. know what you're going to do when, when the when the time comes to fix it. 
you got to have some plans on the shelf. Absolutely. And Agreed. I just stand around saying, yes. Well, so what do we do so that's, now? That's, yeah. that's kind of been my focus. All right. Well, solutions are on always preferable to just talking about problems. No solutions come when you just talk about problems. You have to go beyond the problem and come up with what do you do next? What's plan A, B, and C? All those things you need to think about, whether it's the government, whether it's towns, municipalities, or whether it's yourself and your family, always helps to have plans. Even if they don't work out right, at least you've given it thought and you have a better idea of what to do than others. Hey, so as always, we urge you to participate in the show. Send us an email and the Twitter feeds at Carrie Lutz, the Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. Nathan, been a pleasure speaking with you. We will definitely talk to you again. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.